John Wilkes Booth was a radicalized Southern Democrat who viewed himself as the incarnation of Confederate justice. Similar to antebellum fire eaters, Booth saw the North and the Union through the lens of Calhounist propaganda. It was this programming that convinced him that assassinating the first Republican president would restore the South to its former glory as an established slave empire. Wilkes was radicalized years prior to his assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. It was a pro-slavery association uh, that desired the expansion of slavery into new territories, uh, valued annexation of Mexico and Cuba, and of course naturally approved of secession. So their goals and ultimate goal of the establishment of a vast slave empire uh, were synonymous with the uh, ambitions of the Democrat Party uh, throughout the 19th century, and especially in antebellum America. And nor did his uh, pro-Southern kind of anti-abolition, pro, uh, pro-slavery activism start with his assassination of the great emancipator. Uh, he participated in the apprehension of John Brown at Harper's Ferry. Uh, and of course, he was naturally elated that Brown was executed. Uh, in John Brown, uh, Booth viewed the personification of, uh, of northern ideals and he saw himself as embodying the southern spirit in his manifesto which is lengthy and, and reads exactly as you might assume that the manifesto of a crazed uh, pro-slavery assassin would read uh, Booth lamented that uh, Brown had largely been mythologized whoa that's a tough one <laughs> mythologized so in part, uh, in his manifesto, he writes, When I aided in the capture and execution of John Brown, who was a murderer on our western border, and who was fairly tried and convicted before an impartial judge and jury of treason, and who, by the way, has since been made a god. And it's interesting that he would uh, both celebrate uh, Brown's uh, execution. Well, he refers to him as a murderer, but also almost and actually in the exact same sentence and kind of spitefully, I would, I would assume, that he had been transfigured into a god or a messianic figure. Muth, uh, Booth also described uh, his own lack of active military involvement in the Civil War to fight for the South uh, was evidence to his own cowardice. Uh, so in a letter to his mother, he actually describes himself as both a coward uh, before stating that he despised his own existence. So Booth was really an empty, self-loathing man. Uh, he hoped that by assassinating Lincoln, that he would kind of rise to this uh, an equivalent historical status as old John Brown. Uh, he actually confided this to a friend of his uh, who had asked him, you know, why would you want to kill the president? And his response, not unlike terrorists ever, was that he could live in history. And of course, this is a man who thought very little about himself, considered himself a failure and a coward. So what better way to uh, develop kind of a strange grandiosity than through this particular act? So again, uh, he published his... Well, he didn't publish, excuse me. He wrote a manifesto and actually had it sealed away in a safe. Uh, it was discovered later by federal authorities and by his sister... Uh, who has, she actually wrote a book that in, uh, included much, much if not all of the communications he had with John Brown. Uh, but the manifesto was then published in numerous, numerous newspapers. Uh, and this was, of course, occurred after he had shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. His entire manifesto reads like a Calhounist pro-slavery Democrat speech that you might encounter on the floor of the Senate by the likes of John Calhoun or James Hammond or uh, any other uh, number, uh, you know, perhaps uh, Preston Brooks, for example. And so Booth repeats the same assertions made by Stephen Douglas, uh, of course, the presidential candidate uh, for the Democratic Party in 1860 and one of their leading figureheads. Uh, and that assertion was that the country was founded 
by white men, for white men, and to the exclusion and subjugation of all others. So to encapsulate kind of how these, how closely his ideas align with the Democratic Party at the time, I'm going to read two passages. So the first passage reads, This country was formed for the white, not for the black man. And looking upon African slavery from the same standpoint held by the noble framers of our Constitution, I, for one, have ever considered if one of the greatest blessings, both for themselves and us, that God has ever bestowed bestowed upon a favored nation. Of course, he's referring to slavery there. Uh, A second passage uh, reads, I tell you that, declaring that the Negro and the white man are made equal by the Declaration of Independence and by divine providence is a monstrous heresy. The signers of the Declaration of Independence never dreamed of the Negro when they were writing that document. They referred to white men, to men of European birth and European descent, when they declared the equality of all men. Now, one of the passages I read is by John Wilkes Booth. And the other passage is by Stephen Douglas, uh, the leading Democrat at the time, and the 1860 presidential candidate. And I will just leave it to you to guess uh, which one is attributed to which uh, particular author. And I should think that the difficulty that one uh, encounters in making this decision or this uh, really kind of guesswork is evidence enough to the ideological alignment between Booth and the Democratic Party at the time. I will take a note to see, though, that the Democrat propaganda insisting uh, that the founding was pro-slavery also had an effect uh, by distorting and perverting the founding, by uprooting the historical roots of the nation and its founding ideology, largely through pure invention. Uh, you know, for example, uh, to say that the, the framers uh, never dreamed of the Negro, but then to say that, oh, but they referred to white men, two men of European birth and European descent. Uh, none of those things are either in the Declaration. No more than the word Negro is. It just uses the universal language of all men. But that aside... <clears throat> there is a very real effect whenever you distort things of such paramount importance. And one of those effects was fueling a crazed lunatic to shoot a president in the back of the head while he sat in movie theater. So Booth describes also in this manifesto and in very, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling both from his manifesto and also from uh, various letters, uh, generally one particular one that he authored to his mother He did love his mother very much, Uh, so I guess, uh, and his family, really, although he didn't really have any other friends. Uh, But Booth describes death as a preferable alternative to the abolition of slavery. It would be better to be dead than to allow slavery to end. Uh, Lincoln, in his final speech, uh, again, thanks to Booth, uh, he broached the subject of black suffrage, a massive faux pas. And upon this speech being delivered, Booth confided to a friend... That means inward citizenship. That is the last speech you will ever give. So that Lincoln was in favor of equal suffrage meant that blacks would be citizens. Of course, Booth uses the pejorative term. And the entire struggle of the South at this time, uh, as they're being defeated by the North, was to deny black citizenship. One recalls Dred Scott decision, where an activist court, um, through collusion with Democrat leadership, decided to just arbitrarily define uh, blacks as non-citizens, no matter what. And and so doing, of course, legalized slavery. <clears throat> so thank God uh, Stare Decisis uh, wasn't held up as the uh, immutable and untouchable standard that uh, some <laughs> claim that it is. Uh, Booth also described the election of Lincoln as a war upon Southern rights and institutions. I mean, he verbatim is taking these phrases used by antebellum Democrats and even Democrats prior, and just they're just pl- 
just all over his his letters, his documents, his um, private conversations. So what's interesting, though, is that Booth refers specifically to Southern rights. So this is, is again, another profound illustration of the Calhounist left Hegelian identity politics and the departure from natural rights theory, which was a staple of democratic philosophy, uh, really since its formation. And it's There is no such thing as Southern rights, just like there is no such thing as Northern rights, white rights, black rights, etc. The whole concept of natural rights theory and equality under the law is that no, everybody has an even playing field. Everyone, that doesn't mean that everyone will have the same outcome, everyone will encounter the same resistance, or that we don't have uh, unique elements to our individual lives. To, to even think that such a thing was possible is a juvenile fantasy. But to Booth, there were Southern rights, and of course those Southern rights, as they had always been, was the right to hold uh, blacks as slaves. And Booth described himself as a Confederate and as a Southerner repeatedly. Uh, he considered condemnations against slavery uh, in the South, uh, many of which described Democrats as a treasonous group, properly so. Uh, but Booth described these as constantly hearing every principle dear to my heart denounced as treason. So to claim that southern states seceding and then in instigating a civil war was an act of treason, that harmed Booth's southern confederate sensibilities. He even signed his manifesto as, quote-unquote, a confederate doing duty upon his own responsibilities. Now, Booth was weaponized. Uh, he was... Uh, programmed, really, through the f relentless, fiery rhetoric and propaganda. The same propaganda that conditioned vast swaths of illiterate, impoverished, non-slaveholding whites to fight and die in order to protect the so-called Southern right for the uh, political elite to own slaves. So not unlike those whites, uh, Booth had nothing to gain from his actions at all. Uh, it was an absurd assertion built out of the fantasies uh, that were constructed by Democrat, Democrat propagandists. And, of course, their intent was to secure political power and to weaponize public ignorance, uh, but not unlike many other unfortunate consequences. Uh, violence and death were the result. And, of course, these strategies never changed. Uh, similar uh, strategies were actually used uh, to really kind of uh, indoctrinate, if you will, assassins or uh, acts of ter political terrorism. Uh, of course, uh, rather uh, poignant to this discussion is the uh, recent kind of modern event where a man uh, attempted to assassinate a Supreme Court justice as a tool of affecting political change. So you have this constant theme of acting outside of the civilized political body politic and the systems in place, instead taking revolutionary action. Of course, this, this type of revolutionary action, as we understand from natural rights theory, uh, is not revolutionary uh, beyond the mere ad use of the word as an adjective, uh, but it, it is not a good thing. Uh, so unlike many subsequent events, however, uh, Booth was actually successful to a limited extent. Uh, so by assassinating Abraham Lincoln, for, he uh, that allowed... Uh, Andrew Johnson to rise into office, and of course he was a Democrat. Although as a point of irony, uh, Andrew Johnson was also supposed to be assassinated by a co-conspirator of Booth, uh, but that man lost his nerve, got drunk, and was later hung for conspiring. So that's a that's a good time. But with Johnson in the Oval Office, uh, with a Democrat in the Oval Office. Uh, he just so happened to be a Confederate sympathizer. Uh, Johnson, of course, uh, gains the infamous notoriety in history as being the president who vetoed every civil rights act that came across his desk 
and including every Reconstruction Act, and he did everything he could to obstruct uh, the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And perhaps most damaging is Johnson reversed kind of the Lincoln-era policy where ex-Confederates were not allowed to, uh, to, be, to possess political office. Johnson didn't see anything wrong with putting men into positions of power who, uh, less than a year earlier, had been sending massive waves of their countrymen to die uh, to attack their northern neighbors. But that was all well and good. Uh, so, essentially, uh, the assassination of, assassination of Lincoln led to the, re the return, really, of the Southern Democrat political monopoly, uh, though it, it was a little, <laughs> a little sloppier than that, with the, especially when uh, Ulysses S. Grant got involved. So even though Lincoln's death did not uh, realize the, uh, the slave utopia that Booth and many Democrats uh, kind of envisioned for their future, he did do irreparable harm to the reintegration of the southern states into the Union uh, and really helped pave the way for the racist Jim Crow Democrats to assert uh, their political dominance in the defeated Confederate states. And, of course, this gave rise to a number of different calamities. So one is left to wonder, then, how things might have worked out had Lincoln not been assassinated. Uh, but despite wanting to live on as a glorified Christ-like figure, uh, one would assume, like John Brown, as he was clearly jealous of his legacy. Instead, John Wilkes Booth just tells the story of a very sad, empty, purposeless man uh, whose sense of self-loathing and, and really uh, made him very vulnerable to the incendiary, fiery rhetoric that had been pushed throughout the states, especially in the South now for decades upon decades. And that propaganda was meant to uh, kind of galvanize a political uh, supportive base to create a type of army when it came to the Civil War. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it had the, uh, we hope anyway, unforeseen consequence of creating a kind of, I don't know, like an MK Ultra type of assassin. Uh, he was convinced that by doing these things, it would restore the Union. And he was convinced that by assassinating Lincoln, that it would somehow provide a solution to all of the woes of the nation, including the torments uh, of his own soul. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe, share, and leave a five-star review. The Shane Carraway Show is available on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Red Circle, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, visit 1787project.com to learn more.